Fifteen years ago that I was eating lunch with a Presbyterian minister named John Tackox. John had been studying the Word of God and concluded that baptism was immersion in water for the remission of sins, and he complied with that, stood up in the pulpit of the Presbyterian church where he ministered, and told the people, it's contrary to everything I've ever believed, preached, or practiced, but my life has never been the same since I got water baptized. And he said... Uh, 37 people came forward and he took them down to Jenkins Creek outside of Carthage, Missouri and baptized them all into Jesus Christ. And as we were sharing about this, he said, you know, boys, however, in the Great Commission, the major emphasis of Jesus was not baptism. He said, did you realize that there are four commandments in the Great Commission and only one of them is an imperative? Go uh, is a participle. Uh, baptize is a participle. Teach is a participle, but the only imperative in the Great Commission is to make disciples. Now, uh, those participles do have the force of commandments, I understand, but uh, grammatically speaking, I am convinced it is undeniable that making disciples is more important than the other, and I began to ask myself the question, what am I doing about this? Am I making disciples? Here are some of the notes that I have made in the last two years as I've tried to be honest with my God. Uh, Alexander Campbell, in his debate with Bishop Purcell, took the position that the Great Commission doesn't directly apply to us. I think he may be right about that. Uh, did uh, God command given to go into all the world? Not necessarily, but those guys, he did literally command them to go into all the world, and they literally did that. Before their death, they divided up the world, I understand, and uh, Thomas went one direction, Peter went another direction, so forth. They were literally doing what Jesus commanded them to do, but at, uh, even, notwithstanding, I still felt a burden. God, are you calling me to make disciples? Was I doing that? Was I giving that a major emphasis in my life? And I concluded that I wasn't, and I wanted to be right with God, so I went to the Word of God, and here are some of my notes. I have uh, the Greek text... Uh, Xeroxed here from Matthew 28. I have uh, some copious notes on that. I uh, discovered that the, uh, the word mathetes uh, for disciple uh, occurs 264 times in the New Testament scriptures. It's the basis of our English word math. And uh, yet I was amazed that it is found only in the Gospels and Acts. It is never found in the Epistles or Revelation. Never. Now, isn't that something that Jesus commanded these guys to make disciples? That was the major thrust of his commission to them. And yet when you get into the epistle, now the word manthano, which means to learn, is found a number of times, but you never read the word disciples in the epistle. And I kept asking myself, why? And I, as I struggled to know and to understand the will of Jesus Christ, I found instead of illumination, I found confusion. And I knew that the Boston Church of Christ had a discipling influence, and they were going. I had read about the church in Seoul, Korea, Paul Young, he chose the biggest congregation in the world, emphasis on discipleship. And I wanted to be a part of the Lord's work. I wanted to be making disciples. But I couldn't get my head screwed on right. I just couldn't. Uh, nothing seemed to be coming uh, very clear to me. And then in the last year or so, all of a sudden I have had... Uh, an awakening, an awareness, which has given me a peace in my heart, and that's what I want to share with you. You know, Peter said that we would do well to take heed unto the prophetic word as unto a light that shines in a dark place till the day dawn. Amen. And all of a sudden, you're, you know, the lights they had were little lamps, little olive oil lamps, and under the best of circumstances, not even as good as the old kerosene lamps we had here in the United States. And on a dark night, a little lamp like that's better than nothing. But when the day dawns, you can even see in the shadow. You know. And uh, so there has been in my life ever increasing circles of awareness, and we use that expression, something is dawning on me. Now let's go back and start with the very obvious fact that the world is not 
a technical world. Most people in the world are illiterate. They are not technical people. I remember Don speaking to a group of Christians in central Mexico, Otomi Indians, in 1963. Gil Contreras was my translator, and I was using David and Goliath as an illustration, and Brother Contreras said, now these are Christian people. He said, boys, they've never heard the story of David and Goliath. They'd accepted Jesus Christ as their Savior, but they didn't have a Bible in the Otomi language. They were brand new in the faith. They didn't know even the story of David and Goliath. And here are all my technical notes <laughs> on discipleship. What, what, what good are they going to be to these guys, you know? My brother Don DeWelt and I had the privilege of going to India a couple of years ago and uh, preaching and stand for hours and listen to you. But again, a great many of those people were illiterate people and in the outlying districts, it's a privilege to go to school. They have only a certain number of students that they will allow in the school and if you don't behave, you're a discipline problem. They just put you out. Somebody else gets your seat in the school. We do not live in a technical world. If there's anybody in the world that ought to be technical, it's the citizens of the United States of America, a scarce 6% of the people on this planet, and we're not technical. If you don't believe that, go home and try and program your VCR. I don't believe there are a half a dozen people here that could do it. Now, you say, oh, yeah, I know how to do that. Well, they ran a test on this thing. You know, they said, you know, you record this program on this channel from 6 to 7 on Thursday night, and people couldn't do it. Oh, yeah, I know how to do that, and they'd get the thing screwed up somehow. We are not technical. Now, when the Lord selected apostles, he didn't select technical people. Gary Morrison was speaking to the four state Christian men in Joplin, Missouri, a few months ago. And uh, he asked this question, you know, suppose Jesus came to Joplin to get 12 apostles. Would he get them at the Ozark Christian College? Now he said, I don't know, I don't want to be presumptuous, but I, he said, I don't think so. You know, when he came the first time, he didn't go to Jerusalem and get the skinheads, the eggheads, the scholars. He didn't do it, did he? Well, he said <laughs> We've got uh, tri-state trucking there. And he said, wouldn't it be some of you went out there and got a bunch of truck drivers? <laughs> you know, we make jokes about 10-4, good buddy. We make jokes about truck drivers. They have the, these family going on vacation, you know, and they're going out through Arizona and see a real cowboy. And the kids, oh, let's take his picture. Let's talk to him. And so they get out and say, why do you wear that big hat? He says, oh, it keeps the rain off the snow. It's real. I can water my horse in it, put oats in it. Real practical. Well, why do you have uh, on the snaps on your... Oh, we're going through the brush, you know, I don't tear buttons off and the flaps keep my cigarettes dry and it's real practical. You know? Well, why do you wear them funny britches? Well, you know, they said, uh, when I'm going through the brush, it keeps from, the briars from tearing... Well, that's real practical. So, well, why do you have on tennis shoes? <laughs> he said, you wouldn't want people to think I was a truck driver, would you? <laughs> We make jokes about it. And they made jokes about the apostles, didn't they? Amen. They made jokes. These guys talk funny. These are uneducated and unlearned men. They made fun of them. And the essence of discipleship was nothing technical. These guys, they weren't priests. They couldn't go into the holy place and go through a ritual. The priests did that. They were the professionals. They were the guys that the jots and tittles and all. He's a bunch of fishermen. The emphasis Jesus gave these guys was follow me. He didn't give them a manuscript and say, now sit down and figure this out. I'm going to test you tomorrow at 10 o'clock. He didn't say that. He said, follow me. Now, they say, well, where are you going? Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter where you go. How long are we going to be gone? Doesn't matter how long we're going to be. You don't have to understand all that. Don't clutter your mind with a lot of irrelevant details like that and concern 
All you need to know is follow me. And it seems, now that's 80 times in the gospel, some kind of, the, the concept of following. He said it to Matthew, he said it to uh, Peter and Andrew, James and John. Follow me, follow me, follow me. I'm going to lead you, I'm going to guide you, I'm going to direct you. And it seems to me that he avoided anything which could become ritualized. Now, they were coming out of a ritual concept. Now, they're going to have a relationship. Not a ritual, but a relationship. So, when he healed one blind man, he spat right in his eyes. Next time, he spat on the ground and he made a spittle of clay and put it on his eyes and said, Go wash in the pool of Siloam. When he came to Bartimaeus and his friend, he didn't spit at all. Now, can you imagine how confusing this would be to the disciples? Lord, you know, they meet a blind guy and they're going to, he, he sends them out, you know, heal the sick, raise the dead, all this kind of stuff. And they come across a blind guy and they go, what's the ritual? What's the ritual for healing on the blind guy? Let me get that out here, you know. It was not a ritual. It was a matter of obedience to him. They were at the time, you know, one time he sent them out and said, don't take any money, don't take gold, don't take purse, don't take brass, don't take staff, don't take extra pair of shoes, you just go, and when you need guidance, I'll give it to you at the time. Don't worry about it. Don't be anxious about what you're going to say when they deliver you up. Take no thought, however, what you shall speak. I'll give it to you when you need it. One day at a time, I am going to guide you. Now, the night before Calvary, there was this ominous air, and they got concerned because he was going away. And where I'm going, you can't follow me. Oh, no. For three years, Lord, that's the only way we've survived. We didn't know what to do, and we were always looking to you. Now what? Are we? Oh, that's all right. I'm not leaving you as orphan. I'm not going to abandon you. You guys can't figure it out on your own, and I don't expect you to. You just remember this. I am going to come back, and I'm going to dwell in you. My father and I are going to make our abode with you, and we're going to continue to guide you. We're going to always be there. Well, when he ascended up into heaven, he reminded them again, don't go out on your own. Don't you think you can pull this off on your own? Don't you try and figure that out on your own? You stick right here in Jerusalem till you get power from on high. Now, when they met in the upper room, they didn't gather with their manuscripts. They said, well, we've got to figure this thing out. They were waiting on guidance from above, waiting on guidance from the Spirit of God, and it came. Now, you can't read the book of Acts without realizing that throughout the entirety of the book of Acts, the Holy Spirit was guiding, directing, leading, forbidding, helping, assisting. That's the message of the book of Acts. Now, Isaiah said, with reference to God, my thoughts are not your thoughts, my ways are not your ways. As the heavens are high above the earth, my ways are above your ways, my thoughts above your thoughts. And boy, when I read the book of Acts, see, once again, I was looking for a ritual with reference to discipleship. I thought we're going to franchise this thing so that I'm going to, you know, I expected uh, Peter, Andrew, James, and John to get 12 disciples. That was my mentality when I began this in. I thought you gather. Jesus came and gathered around him a group of 12. And why didn't Peter gather around him a group of 12? Why didn't Andrew gather around him a group of 12? Why, why didn't they do what Jesus did? That's what Jesus, why didn't they do that? But the major emphasis was not a ritual, as I said before, but a relationship. Jesus said, you tarry in Jerusalem till you be endued with power from on high. Don't go out on your own. I'm going to guide you. Don't try it on your own. And when it came time for Peter to preach to Cornelius, he did. But it, once again, it wasn't because he had gone into his 
study and just figured it all out. It was the guidance and direction of the Holy Spirit that enabled Peter to understand this. And this ties in with the 8th chapter of the book of Romans beautifully because in the 14th verse, our Bible teaches us that as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. And if you're not led by the Spirit of God, you can't get into discipleship. You can't do the work of God at all. You're in the flesh and not in the Spirit. So, at any rate, uh, I began to have a peace about this. That when the Lord created the heavens and the earth, it was all good. Now, it might not have looked that way at 10 o'clock on Monday morning, but it all worked out all right because the Spirit of God was brooding over the whole creative process. And when he got done, it was very good. Amen. Now there are... The, the word poieo means make or do in the, and it's a, used 500 times or so. But the word poema is a noun form of that and it's only used two times. Only two times in the Bible. The first time it talks about the physical creation and it's translated as made in the King James Version in Romans 1.20. The invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made. Poema, which is the basis of our English word poem. So you look at the created universe and we see harmony, meter, rhyme. Uh, God's not the author of confusion but of peace. And all the universe is in such harmony that it is like a gigantic poem created by God. The only other time that the word poema is used in Scripture is in Ephesians 2.10 where it's translated in the King James Version as workmanship. We are His workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. And there is in the spiritual creation a great harmony because we are led of the Spirit. The same Spirit that brooded over and presided over the physical creation is right now brooding over and presiding over the spiritual creation and there will be harmony among all those who are born of the Spirit and heresies are a way that poison is excreted from this harmonious body because the heretic will cling to someone or something other than Jesus. 1 Corinthians 11:19 tells us there must also of necessity be heresies among you so that they which are approved may be made manifest. The heretic clings to someone else, something else, those who are approved, and I'm hoping and praying it's you and me. We are the ones who cling to Jesus, and because we're led of the Spirit, there is a natural order and harmony which we experience even though we've been separated by 30 years of time. Because there is one God and one Spirit, even as you are called, in one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. Now with the old creation, there is a negative prediction. Jeremiah 17, 9, heart, man, deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know? So if a man's heart is wicked, which is true of the alien, true of the man outside of Christ, true of the carnal man, you can always predict something bad is going to happen. In the 31st chapter of Deuteronomy, Moses was getting ready to die, and he was telling these people, you know, while I was alive, you've been rebellious. Isn't that true? You remember the story of the Hebrew people. Boy, they rebelled. He was getting the law of God, and they were down there having an orgy. And he said, what do you think is going to happen when I'm dead? They're going to be better or worse? What do you think? Worse. That's, he said, take this book of the law and put it in the sight of the ark of the covenant of the Lord your God that it may be there for a witness against thee, for I know thy rebellion and thy stiff neck. Behold, while I am with while I am yet alive with you this day, you've been rebellious against the Lord. How much more after my death? You've been a bunch of rebels, and you've been incorrigible, and I couldn't do anything with you, and they had to be policed. In the 17th chapter of Leviticus, there's a prohibition against killing an animal anywhere but at the door of the tabernacle. 
The reason why they couldn't trust these people, you know, they let them over the hill, 500 yards they'd be sacrificing to some pagan god. And they couldn't trust them. And so they, in order to try and conform them, they brought them into the tabernacle and said, now if you're going to kill an ant, you've got to kill it there. And of course, when they inhabited the land of Canaan, they had to make some provision to exempt people from that because if you lived in Capernaum or someplace else, it was impractical to go all the way down to Jerusalem every time you wanted to kill an animal, eat something. But the whole emphasis with reference to the unconverted alien sinner is negative. You can predict that something bad's going to happen because their heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked who can know it. Turn to the 36th chapter of the book of Ezekiel, if you will, and I want to read to you a prediction which God made to an inspired man some centuries before Jesus was born in the manger of Bethlehem. Ezekiel chapter 36, verses 26 and 27. And this, to me, is of a, of a critical nature now. It's a crucial, it's a watershed experience. You and I have to come to grips. Does God mean this or not? He said in Ezekiel 30. Uh, 6, 26, a new heart also will I give you and a new spirit. Now see, they had a heart of stone, a corrupt a heart of man is deceitful, desperately wicked, who can know it? And we have to ask ourselves a question, did, was God really going to give them a new heart or not? A new heart also will I give you and a new spirit will I put within you and I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh and I will give you an heart of flesh and I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statue and that you may keep my judgments and do them. Now then, if this is true, and I believe it is, then with reference to the new creation, we got a whole different set of equations. A, t a totally different system is now. See, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things are passed away, and all things are become new. So now we have a people with a new heart, not a wicked heart, not any longer because God took away the old stony heart. He gave him a heart of flesh and he knew that something good was going to happen and I challenge you to read through the New Testament scriptures and look for this positive confidence. I've got again listed a whole bunch of scriptures about confidence in Jesus Christ. You'll find it in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Paul was confident about the Corinthians. You'll find it in Galatians chapter 5. He was confident about the Galatians. Ephesians 3.12, he was confident to the Ephesians. Philippians chapter 1 and verse 6, uh, he knew, he had confidence that what he who had begun a good work in them would perform it under the day of Jesus Christ. Colossians chapter 1, he was confident about the Colossians. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 23 and 24, he was confident that God was going to do a good work um, in the Thessalonians. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, Philemon chapter 21, Paul writes to Philemon, with reference to Onesimus, you know, we got this thing, Murphy's Law, anything bad's going to happen, you know, it will happen. That's not a Christian concept whatsoever. We believe that all things work together for the good to them that love God and are the called according to his purpose. And when you take a child of God and beat him up unjustly and put him down inside the inner prison at midnight without a light, he'll be singing. He'll be singing. Man alive, there's a pony in here somewhere. God's going to work a blessing. Isn't it going to be great to see what's going to happen now? Because we've got, he writes to Philemon, he says, I'm confident that you're going to do more than I ask. Yeah, you're not just going to do what I want you to do. You're going to do more than that. And so the believer is not one who draws back under perdition. Amen but of them that have faith to the saving of the soul. The ultimate expression of the lack of confidence is in this Newsweek article, April the 9th, 1990. Memorandum on a mass murder. And there was a man named List who murdered. John E. List, 64, is on trial in Elizabeth, New Jersey for the 1971 murders of his wife, 
three children, and 84-year-old mother. Last week, the judge released a five-page letter list left behind for his pastor. Now, he was supposedly a Christian, and one of the reasons why he killed his family was so that they would be in heaven. His 16-year-old daughter, as an example, was Pat. She had aspirations of being an actress. And this man, because he had no faith, no confidence in Christ, in the Holy Spirit, in the power of the Spirit to keep, he didn't have any confidence at all in that. He had confidence in himself, and so he killed his 16-year-old daughter because he just knew that if she lived to be 25, she'd go to hell. So he said... At least I'm certain that all have gone to heaven now. If things had gone on, who knows? Isn't it a shame that that man did not really have any confidence in Christ? That the God who created the sun and the moon and the stars and who keeps the precision clockwork of the heavens under his control and supervision is at this very moment supervising and superintending his body upon the earth. He is the head of his body, the church. He's the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, and by him all things are held together. In him it is the plan of God to sum up all things in heaven and earth, visible and invisible, thrones, dominions, principality, all things are going to be brought together in Jesus Christ. He is not the author of confusion. Amen. He is the author of peace. So as I applied this concept to discipling, I began to get a peace. It isn't for me. I'm not God. I don't have any nail prints in my hands. It, and... Uh, all I have to do, and all you have to do in a sense. See, one of the things that we, one of the traps we fall into is that I think I have to, to um, plan your life for you. There may be something very diabolical about that. You know, the doctrine of the Nicolaitan. Nikao means to rule and Laos means people, and God hates the doctrine of the Nicolaitan. So I should not try and plan your life for you and try and superintend your life for you. The one thing that I need to do for you is what Paul did for the Romans. He said, to their own master they stand or fall. You know, I, don't sit in judgment on the Romans. Here's a man who is weak, and he eats only herbs. And it would be a real temptation for a man like Paul who was spiritually mature to go in and try and live their lives for them and have their faith for them. No, no, no. They should only walk in the light that they have. They should not violate their conscience. They should be obedient to their own master. And as they are obedient to their own master, and I am obedient to my own master, like sheep converging on a shepherd, the closer we get to Jesus, the closer we're going to get to one another. And if we ever arrive at the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, we will not only be in perfect and complete harmony with our blessed Lord, we will also be in perfect and complete harmony with one another. Amen. The real temptation is for us to be men pleasers. And the Bible teaches in Galatians 1.10, if I yet sought to please men, I could not be a servant of my blessed Lord. I am convinced that there are carnal minds who are at enmity against God, who don't want to walk in the Spirit, live in the Spirit, rejoice in the Spirit, or follow the leading of the Spirit. But my brethren, I am persuaded better things of you. And somehow right here in this room, I believe there are people who really want to follow the leading of the Spirit of God in their lives. Let us pray. Oh, Father, thank you for Jesus Christ, the shepherd and bishop of our souls, who recognizes our infirmity and remembers that we are dust. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that we don't have to be scholars and technicians. All we have to do is to be obedient. And when you give us a desire to do your will, you'll also give us the ability. You work, and may, may we therefore work out our own salvation with fear and trembling. Amen. Amen.